good there. Well, thanks for the invitation to come talk to you. Um, I, I'm going to start with planetary boundaries, but only very briefly before I move to ecosystem services and really focus a lot of what I have to say there on uh, some of the work that we've been doing at McGill and are doing now around Canada and then what I see as um, some of the most interesting next steps. And I'm going to try to push through quickly because I realize I have a a lot of slides for a, for a short period of, of time. So I want to start uh, with where I think we are right now, which is in the Anthropocene, a new geologic epoch in which humankind has emerged as a globally significant and potentially intelligent force that is capable of reshaping the face uh, of, the, of the planet. And I want to start there because I think that this idea, living in the Anthropocene, where people have a significant impact on the planet, really demands that uh, we develop some sort of new paradigm, a new way of understanding uh, what it is about our place on the planet and how uh, we want to live on the planet in a way that maintains the Earth system in some sort of resilient and accommodating state that we can continue uh, to live. So acknowledging that we're uh, living in the Anthropocene, brings with the challenges, the Anthropocene challenge, chief among them, how do we make the kinds of decisions about how we live on the planet, how we organize human life to stay within critical thresholds. So this slide shows uh, a, a project that I was fortunate to work on, these planetary boundaries, which are uh, nine thresholds or planetary boundaries um, that we believe once we pass those, create significant changes to the Earth system. And I worked in particular on helping to define the location of the nitrogen and phosphorus boundaries and understand where are we uh, relative to the, the state of the planet. While I do a fair amount of work like this at the global scale and especially on nutrients, one thing that, that this project in particular made me really curious about was Okay, so, so we have these global scale boundaries. We have a, a sense, at least vaguely, of you know, what, what is the limit? How much phosphorus can we move around the planet in fertilizers to grow food before we start to create significant problems? But I started to get interested in, well, how does that change what Farmer X does on the ground? Or how should that change what Farmer X does uh, on the ground? So how can this kind of theoretical development be applied at a, a local scale. So pretty early in my time at McGill, I went out to a bunch of local stakeholders. I talked about the planetary boundaries. I, I asked them about what was important um, to them and what were critical problems that, that science might help them to uh, address. And, and this is something that if you have the opportunity to do, I would highly uh, recommend it. it was, very interesting, but it was really hard. It was difficult to find the place of overlap between what the community was interested in and the kinds of questions they were facing and the kinds of things that were theoretically interesting to me. And in fact, it took a year or maybe even two years of conversation before I felt like we could even get to the place where we were ready to write a grant proposal to enter into um, to starting to do this, this work. So some of the hardest work that I've ever done, but in some ways also some of the most gratifying work. So I want to talk a little bit more about that. So this is um, uh, some images of the place that we settled on working in. Um, I can talk a little bit more later about why we settled on working in this place. It's called the Monteregie. It's a really beautiful agricultural landscape just outside of Montreal to the southeast of Montreal. There is um, some forest, mostly in patches around agricultural fields. It's mostly agricultural, probably 80% agriculture. Um, it's rapidly suburbanizing. It's about 45 minutes outside of Montreal. So it's a sort of community of people who are moving there, who are interested in commuting or even telecommuting into to Montreal. The um, big hill up there that you see on the top picture is called Mont Saint-Hilaire. It is a biosphere reserve. It houses a McGill field station and houses a nature center. That was really important to our decision to work in this community because it meant that this community was really used to the ideas of biodiversity. That was something that was well uh, uh, in hand. People were very familiar with talking about conservation, with thinking about biodiversity. 
Another reason that we picked this region is a few things that were going on at the time. So one is in the greater Montreal area, which includes this region, the city had decided and passed a law or regulation that 17% of the land in every county was going to be set aside for green space. And every county was responsible for deciding where that 17% was, was going to be and how they were going to do that. But the communities really had no idea what that meant or how to go about that at all. What, which green spaces were most important? Where should they be restoring green space? What should be, what should be preserved? Um, how to go about it. But there was money there to do that. And this community in particular was coming to us and saying, hey, listen, we've been talking to researchers about biodiversity for 10, 15, 20 years, but it's not helping us make decisions about what forests we need to, to protect. And the landscape planners were coming to us and saying, hey, we're only making reactive decisions. We're never able to be proactive. We're, we're sort of constantly responding to someone saying, can I build a road here? Should I put them all there? And they wanted to get out ahead of the game and make a plan uh, in advance. So in addition to the community's interest driving this sort of 17% of the land, we had some scientific ideas that we wanted to explore too. And, and chief among them was this feeling, this thought that I had been developing for a while, which was even though we have a sense that all of our landscapes are providing a lot of benefits, um, which I'll call ecosystem services, we were managing them as if they only provided one, or maybe one in trade-off with another. Um, and, and, and that didn't seem like that was working out so well for us. You know, for example, if we manage our agriculture as if the most important, the only thing that that agricultural landscape is producing is food, uh, we might end up with really poor water quality and, and uh, algal blooms in, in lakes like this. So there's a lot of evidence that was brewing that uh, dynamics among ecosystems were um, that we were forgetting to pay attention to a management, we're increasing the, the risk of regime shifts in which we might get these sudden and unexpected changes in other ecosystem services like water quality that were also important to us. Okay. After we settled on working in this community, we started by working to define the ecosystem services, so the benefits that people get from nature, that were important to the region. And we would go out and say, what, what do you see? Here's a soybean field. There's Mont saint Hilaire in the background. What is this landscape doing for you? And people would say food. Um, we would get to wood. Uh, we would get to maple syrup. A lot of people are using these wood lots at the end of their fields for heating their homes. They have sugar shacks, so they're getting maple syrup out of that. Um, if we pushed a little bit more, we would get things like water quality regulation, pest regulation, carbon storage, climate regulation. Uh, and if we continued to push, we would get things like deer hunting and aesthetic beauty uh, and, and recreation. So with that in mind, we set out to help this community make proactive decisions in order to keep their landscape resilient and multifunctional, delivering all of the benefits that they were telling us were important on this landscape. And we wanted to do that by helping them to understand the ecosystem services that are provided on the landscape, and in this case, how they're affected by landscape configuration, by where things are on the, on the landscape. We have our, our set of ecosystem services that we're going to measure, about a dozen of them that we're going to go out and measure all across this community um, that includes all of the services that I, uh, that I just mentioned to you, including uh, um, what we call cultural services, things like recreation uh, and deer hunting, provisioning services like food and regulating services like um, soil phosphorus retention to keep good quality water and flood control. And, and what we were interested in was what are the different kinds of services that are provided in different parts of this landscape? So here, um, the length of these petals, so a longer petal means that there's more of that service being provided. And so we were interested, you know, if you have a landscape that looks like this, does that mean that you're going to have cottages and forest recreation, uh, but not very much agricultural production? And does that landscape mean that you're going to get a lot of crops, but pretty poor water quality? And, and sort of how much room is there for me to pull one of these petals out and lengthen one without causing a decline 
uh, in others. Um, we built a set of hypotheses about the, the theory of how this might work that had to do with how these services interact with one another. So uh, for example, um, down here where there's two services, water quality and crop yield, and they're not interacting with each other. They're just responding to a shared driver. So we know that fertilizer use increases crop yield, but it causes declines in water quality. So maybe there are some opportunities there to pull those petals apart. Maybe I can affect my crop yield without affecting water quality if I can make the right kinds of management. But maybe it's more difficult, uh, for example, up in that top left box, where uh, conservation tillage is uh, impacting erosion control, so I have less erosion if I have conservation tillage. That leads to better crop yield. Better crop yield leads to even better erosion control. And now I've got a situation where the services themselves are interacting, and it's a little harder to, to pull apart for better or worse. So we started uh, just looking to develop a method to measure these services. This is work that was done by Kara Raudsep Hearn, who was uh, a, a PhD student in the lab, and she just went out and quantified these services across this landscape using primarily existing data that was available from the Census of Agriculture, from uh, government records about taxes that people were paying on summer homes, uh, from a private company that collects data and locations on every deer kill in the location, in the, in the whole region. So we used all of that data just to map ecosystem services across this region. Um, so on these maps here, Montreal is sort of over in this area, uh, and each different color is a county. So she did this county by county, uh, one, one average number for each county for a dozen different services. And you can see that every service has its own map that it makes across the landscape. There are areas where we grow crops, there are areas where we're producing pork. Uh, there are uh, areas where we have mostly uh, forest <coughs> recreation. And then we were able to use that data uh, county by county to look at the, the correlations and trade-offs. So how are those petals interacting with one another? Um, just through a pairwise correlation, lots of significant correlations here. Um, two things to point out, neither of which is going to be surprising to anyone who thinks about agriculture uh, and, and other ecosystem services. So one is we get uh, red here, which are trade-offs between agriculture and basically everything else on the landscape. So in these areas where we have intensive agriculture, we really don't get much else in the way of other ecosystem services. And perhaps a little bit more maybe not surprisingly, but interestingly, where we are on the landscape and we have a lot of those regulating services, so flood control and uh, carbon storage, there we get a lot of synergies. So we have a lot of interesting mixes of services that happen on those parts of the landscape where we're focused on those, uh, those things like carbon sequestration, soil organic matter, forest recreation, deer hunting. Those all overlap for us on the landscape. Okay, so uh, let me walk back to configuration. So now we've got the sense of where things are across the landscape, but remember I told you that we were interested in, in whether it mattered where things were on the landscape, because the community wants to know from us this forest or that forest. I've got a million dollars, which one am I gonna, <coughs> gonna protect? So first we just wanted to make sure that where mattered. Maybe it's just what that matters. Um, so that was our first goal, was to just confirm that hypothesis. So um, uh, what is configuration? So these are different hypothetical landscapes. They all have the same composition. In other words, each one of these pictures is 50% green for forest and 50% yellow for agriculture. Um, and at the time that we were doing this, the, the really top of the line ecosystem service models treated every pixel of, of forest just like any other pixel of forest. So if you were a green pixel of forest surrounded by agriculture, or you were a green pixel of forest surrounded by forest, the assumption in the best models of the day were that pixel of forest produces exactly the same benefits no matter where it is on the landscape. We were pretty sure that that 
was not the case, but we wanted to go out and, and measure and test. Um, this was work done by Katie Liss, who was a master's student in the lab, looking at how landscape structure interacted to influence service provision. Um, she quantified composition, so what's on the landscape, and three aspects of configuration. Position, which is where things are. Connectivity, so in other words, how close are the forest patches to one another? And then shape, you know, is this a one big blob or is it something with a lot of sinews and pieces to it? Uh, she built a theoretical structural model that really is the visual image of her hypothesis about how this works. So you can see uh, composition affects services directly. We know that a forest is going to do different things for us than a patch of agriculture. Um, but also that these aspects of configuration are going to play a role too. They're going to influence uh, ecosystem services and composition of course is going to influence configuration. If you don't have very much forest, it's much harder for the forest to be, to be connected. So she built this model and then we tested this model with the data that Kira had collected about the, the landscapes. Um, and this is what we find. So what you are seeing in uh, red is the impact of composition. So what is on the landscape. In blue, the influence of configuration, and in gray, the influence of both. And, and this actually surprised us quite a bit, because I figured that configuration was going to play some role, but I didn't realize how much of a role configuration was going to play, um, especially in some services, things like cottage value uh, and water quality, where the wear is really making a huge difference uh, on the services that are, that are provided. Okay, so with that in hand, we now set out to go out on the ground and measure ecosystem services everywhere that we could across the landscape. I'm going to spend most of my time on the present piece of this, um, but we also went back in the past about 100 years of history of land use and ecosystem services and then built some scenarios with our stakeholders about what potential futures were and used all of the information from present and past about the relationships between land use, biodiversity, and service, services to model out in the future and say, okay, what are you going to get if you configure your landscape in these different ways? Um, I'm going to give just a few examples of some of what we, we studied on the ground. But we basically, I want you to picture an army of graduate students and undergrads out on this landscape measuring all aspects of land use and land cover uh, with remote sensing and, uh, and GIS, measuring everything that we could think of about biodiversity, ecosystem function, and ecosystem services, uh, and tying those all together. So let me just focus in on two. So one is uh, the work of Matt Mitchell, who was a PhD student on this project. Um, and he was really interested in uh, structure and connectivity on services and especially in agricultural areas. And so what he uh, decided to do was pick forests. Um, this is an easier way to look at this. So forests that were either connected, meaning that they were within 200 meters of another patch of forest, or forests that were isolated, meaning there was at least a kilometer between that forest and the nearest patch of forest. Uh, and then forest patches that were either small, less than 10 hect hectares in this landscape, or large, greater than 200 hectares. And in every one of these forests, he would walk a transect. I got that. Um, he would walk a transect off of these forests and measure a set of ecosystem services, uh, in his case, above and below ground. Um, so these are the sorts of things that he measured. So in a, the first 100 meters, here's my forest patch. Right? So he's going to walk this way. And in the first 100 meters, he's going to measure uh, things like soil phosphorus retention, soil nitrogen, carbon litter decomposition, microbial activity, and soybean yield. Uh, and then in the first 500 meters, additionally measure things like insect diversity, herbivory on the, the soybean feed plants, soybean aphid abundance, and soybean yield. Uh, 
Um, and I'll give just an example of one of the things that he found. So here's that distance from forest again. Uh, and this is soybean yield. And so you can see that at the edge of the forest, there's a real decline in uh, soybean production. Um, so whether that's competition with the forest or it's the tractor turnaround, it's competition for light or nutrients or water, we don't know. Um, but what you do also see is there's a big positive bump about 100 or 150 meters or so into the field. And when you look deeper into the data, what you see is that the forests, and especially the connected forests, are harboring predators that eat soybean aphids. And so we get a bump in production because we have fewer soybean aphids that are eating the, the soybeans. So we're now able to go to our farmers and say, hey, that forest patch, yeah, you're, you're getting timber from that and you're having a sugar shack and producing maple syrup, but, but did you also know you're actually getting more soybeans? So don't cut that forest patch down at the end of your field. It's giving you multiple different benefits. So another person who did a very similar project was Carly Zier, who was a master's student in the lab, and she was interested in the relationship between biodiversity uh, and ecosystem services, and in particular, whether that was a win-win uh, so in other words, are more biodiverse areas producing more services? Uh, or is there a trade-off? Are more biodiverse areas producing fewer services? She went to the same forest patches that Matt went to, so large and small, connected and unconnected, and also walked transects. But in her case, instead of walking transects uh, uh, into the agricultural field, she turned around and walked into the forest. Uh, and in every forest patch, she's looking at the diameter and the species of every tree. Um, so about 50 different forest stands, about 12,000 different trees. Um, and then using that species in DBH, uh, all, as, as well as all the above ground woody debris, to calculate above ground carbon storage. And so she's going to look at the relationship between carbon storage and biodiversity uh, in these forests. And she also happened to notice while she was out there that some of these woodlots were managed. So managed in this case does not mean uh, timber company management of these forests. It means that somebody has a sugar shack out there or they're cutting down timber to heat their house in the winter. So this is small scale management or they're just ignoring it altogether, so not, not managed. Okay, so this is what Carly found. So this is uh, functional diversity, so higher diversity over here, lower functional diversity over here, and carbon storage uh, on the Y uh, axis. And here's what I want you to see about this. So first of all, the, in red, the non-managed forests, uh, there is a win-win. So in forests that aren't being managed, the more biodiverse they are, the more carbon is being stored in those forests. However, in managed forests, the more biodiverse they are, the less carbon they're storing. So a trade-off in the managed forests, but also in the managed forests, until you get out to these really high functional diversity forests, the managed forests are almost always storing more carbon than the unmanaged forests. Um, or in other words, all forest fragments are not created equal. We have some hypotheses about why this is. If you look through the data, it looks like when people are managing their forests, what they're trying to do is keep really big maple trees in those forests so that they can get more maple syrup. Maple is a very dense wood that stores a lot of carbon. So probably what's happening is they're looking for maple syrup. What they end up getting as a side benefit uh, is not only uh, is, is a lot of carbon storage. Okay, um, so lots, the army, my army of students. So I'm not talking about any of the work that we did on uh, bees, about, about 2,000 bees that we captured and looked at the uh, role of landscapes on pollination. That's incredibly important in this area because one of the big recreation things that's happening here uh, is self-pick uh, apples. Uh, uh, we looked at trees that I talked about, about 300,000 uh, insects that we collected, both the soybean aphids that I talked about, but also a massive study of the riparian area and what was happening 
uh, with water quality, lots of soil samples collected. Um, that's, this is all out there and published, so if you want access to it, I can point you in the right direction. Um, but I want to move on to the past uh, stuff so that I get through everything uh, that I want to get through. So Delphine Renard, who was a postdoc on this project, looked at the relationship between services and land use land cover going back uh, to, to the 1930s, really the late 1920s. And here what we were interested in, we felt like now we have a pretty good sense in the present day of the relationship between land composition and configuration and services. But is that relationship always the same or does it change? Like, Can I just play that relationship out into the future and assume that the relationship between land cover and services is always going to be the same? Or do I need to be adjusting that um, that over time. And again, we went back to our methods of using census data, tax records, um, milk company collected data, and other information to get those services um, back through time. And I'm just going to present the results from the 1970s. Before the 1970s, we have a different set of services and a different set of land use. So I'll just present from the 1970s uh, up to 2006, and every color on this slide is a different bundle or set of services. Um, and here's what I want you to notice about this. Overall, the landscape in terms of the services provided gets no less diverse. So we get the same mix of services across the whole region. So here's Montreal. The same mix, basically, in 1970 and 2006 but a total difference in where those come from across the landscape. So that in the 1970s, every municipality produces a mix of services. And by 2006, every municipality has specialized in a particular service. So they specialize in recreation, they specialize in agricultural production, they specialize in something else. And our landscape looks totally different by the time we get to 2006 from what it looked like uh, in 1970, at least on a municipality by municipality basis. Okay, so we take all of this, all of what we learned, uh, and Sylvester Delmont, another postdoc on this project, it's his job to build the what if machine. In other words, to build the model that takes all of that past information, all of the present information, into some sort of model that the communities can use to try to understand how their current day management might affect the services that they're going to get 5, 10, 20 years down the road in these, uh, in these landscapes. We worked with our scenarios to develop stake, or worked with our scenarios, worked with our stakeholders to develop scenarios about the future. Um, this is a good reminder for me to say that throughout this whole project, we met with, we had an advisory board that was made up of the Chamber of Commerce, uh, the local agricultural producers union, the local nature center, um, an, an NGO, and then the 13 mayors and 13 land use planners that are responsible for, for land management decisions in this region. And we met with them every six months throughout this project. Here's what we're doing. What kinds of decisions are you facing? Where are you at with all of this? So at one of the, those points, we come back to them. We design a set of scenarios about the, the future. So scenarios, it's not meant to be a prediction. This is just meant to be a, a sort of uh, what if happens. And the reason that we do this, it's, it's like in a sports game. It's like getting up on your toes. So you're anticipating some kind of surprise or something that might, uh, that might happen in the future. Even if the surprise that happens isn't the one that you anticipated, it can help you be uh, uh, a little bit more ready for those. So we built... Uh, a set of different scenarios. I'll just show you two of those uh, artists' images of what those look like. So this one, um, it's uh, too much. It's too much. It's still not enough. I guess is how I would translate that. So this is a scenario where demographic growth and infrastructure lead to a lot of urban sprawl. And this was something that people were very worried about in this region. Was were they going to get? Um, the sort of sprawl, we get unprotected areas, green spaces that gets transformed into housing. It's a housing where everybody has their own uh, 
uh, house. And ultimately, uh, in the models, we get departure of a lot of people who once moved to this area because it was so pretty and green and because of the nature center, who really don't want to live there anymore once the, the big box stores are there. Um, we had a very different scenario, like um, go to the green, uh, which is a newly elected government that decides to move forward towards a very sustainable development with uh, wind and solar energy. This was on people's mind when we were developing this because the mayors at the end of this project were trying to decide whether to ban fracking in this area. So that was the big energy development and where they were going with energy was a really big, uh, big question. Um, there was still a lot of population growth in this scenario, but because of that, that rule about the 17% green space, that ends up getting very uh, constricted. So there's lots of multifamily ha homes and a really different kind of structure. Um, and then what Sylvesta did was translate those, and this is just one of our uh, municipalities, the one that we worked with most closely, translated those scenarios into land use predictions and then used his model that he had built to translate those land use predictions using all of our data on composition and configuration into different predictions. In this case, a reference and, a, and scenario one for, um, for example, carbon storage. We did this for um, about six different services on the, on the landscape. I'm going to transition away from that particular project and, and into a little bit more um, future of ecosystem services research. And so I just wanted to stop and mention all of those partners who stayed engaged through this whole project, as well as the students, some of whom I've mentioned, um, the collaborators, and then all of the farmers who's, who led us on their farms and often came out and did a lot of the field work uh, with us. They were very interested in what was going on on their, their farms. So just to say thank you to, to that team. Okay, so what did we learn? I think we learned a lot about uh, the science of ecosystem services, in particular connectivity of the landscape change through time, e interactions in multiple services. Um, I think we learned that as scientists, we knew basically diddly squat about decision making and government processes. We didn't know much about the speed at which those decisions were happening. We didn't know very much about what was influencing those decisions. I think I very much went into it thinking that our 13 land use planners were the gods of decision making and that if I could reach them, that was gonna, everything was gonna change. That was not true. Um, the community in general wasn't really aware of ecosystem services or ecosystem service science at all. So there was a lot of aha moments between us um, and the larger community. And then we, I think we had a lot of success getting people talking. So we had a lot of public engagement um, evenings where we went beyond our advisory board and presented these scenarios to the community, had role-playing events, and got people in the community talking to each other about, well, I like this scenario, I like that scenario, why do you like this one? Um, uh, and, and that was good, and I think for McGill, what was important about this is we became a sort of trusted source of information in the community, and so those land use planners have continued to come back to us with other questions and ideas and what do you know about this and what do you know about that and that's as, as an anglophone university in a francophone world that was uh, a, a pretty important uh, important thing for us um, one of the I want to come back to those land use planners one, one of the things that I learned I think I went into this with this kind of linear model. You know, you put some funding on the, in the one end and you do some research and you talk to some boundary organizations and that leads to, to policy changes and then everybody benefits. And that, this was very much my mental model um, going into this. And, and this is more my mental model coming out of it, um, which is it doesn't really work like that. There's no person at the end with the switch who's able to change things. There's populist movements and there's, elections, in fact, there was an election in the middle of this project and all of our land use planners and all of our mayors turned over, not all, but 50% but of our people turned over in the middle of the project. And things were a lot more influenced by, the, by people and people's concepts and, and movements and ideas than, 
than I, I thought. And it, it became more important in my mind to do this sort of reaching out to, a, to, to communities. Um, and, and it got me thinking a little bit about the value of this kind of science in general to communities. You know, can we link ecosystem services and human well-being? Um, can we do proactive landscape management? Um, that led me ultimately to go back out to managers all across Canada with uh, a survey and try to figure out what are they really asking? What, what do people who are in this position of managing landscapes, and this is done uh, at the county level pretty much across most of Canada, um, what are they asking? So, so here's some of the questions or the answers or questions that they had that we got back from that survey. So first of all, how are services even provided in my particular landscape? Can I use technology? Or do I have to, do I need nature? Do I need to restore that riparian area? Or can I just put in a water treatment plant? That was a question that people were asking. How can I make the service provision in my area resilient to the kinds of global and regional changes that I think are coming? How can I make sure that I can still grow food even when climate change happens in my region? How do I get the services that are provided to the people in my region. Just because there are services provided doesn't mean that anyone is benefiting from them. And so these landscape planners were thinking a lot about, well, does it, does it matter? Who, who benefits from all of this? Um, and then finally, uh, what should I do, basically? What's the best plan for my region, um, given the demands that we have now and likely demands in the future. So you can imagine, we can't answer, we can't even come close to answering all of these questions, but it at least gives us an interesting insight into what people are, um, into what people are, are asking. Okay, so that uh, leads me to what I think are some of the biggest challenges coming forward for ecosystem service. Uh, science based on those questions that managers are asking, but also based on my own sense of what it is that we still don't know about how ecosystems uh, work. And I think there's three areas where we need advance. And I'm going to focus in on the first one and not say very much about the other two. Uh, but they basically are how, how are services co-produced by systems? Where do they even come from? What's the mix of technology and nature? Um, second, who benefits from the provision? And then third, what are the best practices for governance? And those, to me, I think define the biggest upcoming areas for ecosystem service science. Um, let me talk about the first one a little bit, um, a little bit more. And we, we broke this down in this paper into four sub-challenges of that first challenge. So first of all, we know very little about the role of biodiversity and heterogeneity in maintaining services. So we have this sense and we talk about a lot that biodiversity is important to ecosystem services. There are a lot of papers about, uh, about um, biodiversity and ecosystem function. There are a fair number of papers about ecosystem function and ecosystem services. Almost all of those are lab-based and not field-based and there's a big gap between our understanding of how this uh, works in the lab and how this uh, this might work in the world. And I think there's a lot of space there for quantifying and disentangling the influence of various aspects of biodiversity on services. Okay. Uh, the second part of this, what's the effect of landscape level heterogeneity? So let's scale up from biodiversity to landscape diversity. And how does that matter? You know, we know that uh, Species are moving all around these landscapes. There are species behavior changes that are happening in these landscapes that are responding to localized heterogeneity. Um, but we don't really know how and when that comes into play for provision of services or for which services. Okay, third, path dependency and legacies. Um, we think that land use history has a role to play here that one riparian area might not provide the same function as another riparian area because 50 years ago, one was, was being uh, used for crop production and the other one wasn't. But we don't know, and there's very little quantitative science looking back at 
uh, the history of ecosystem services and history of land use. And we're trying to investigate this one in particular uh, in the forests of BC, looking at forests that were logged uh, anywhere between 100 years ago and five years ago at the recovery of services over time as those forests grow uh, back in and looking at recovery of services after a number of different kinds of disturbances. Um, and then finally, what's the role of social systems in ecosystem service supply and in delivery of benefits to people? So, you know, I mean, human intervention is a massive driving force in all of this. If I come back to this idea of the, the Anthropocene, we are protecting, conserving, using, altering, destroying, rehabilitating, and otherwise changing ecosystems for our own benefit all of the time. Um, but when we think about ecosystem services, we tend to kind of push that off the plate of, of what we're, we're studying, and yet our managers are asking us, do I really need nature, or can I just build the water treatment plant? Um, and we don't have an answer to that. Uh, right now. One of the things, this is Jesse Reeb, who's a PhD student in my lab, who's looking at this uh, right now, and he's looking at um, relationships between natural capital and other capitals in the provision of ecosystem services, in particular looking at crops, water quality, uh, and recreation uh, all across um, the United States. So for example, uh, in crops, we're looking at uh, counties across 10 states. Our indicator of ecosystem services is we have corn yield uh, in tons per acre. We know the natural capital, we know about the soils because there's a national commodity and crop productivity index, so we know which soils are higher quality than others. And then we also have information about what people are doing with technology on those fields, where they're using fertilizer, chemicals, pesticides, herbicides, fuel, and labor and how those are contributing. And we're able to map across all of these uh, 10 states, what kind of service provision do we get with different combinations of natural capital and other capitals. Um, I won't stop on this for very long, but we can do that for water quality uh, and we can do that for recreation too. And Jesse's now building a, a model based on this data uh, that looks at service provision um, with different relationships between capitals. So are the capitals substitutes or complements of one another? Is, does changing one capital increase or decrease the other capitals? And doing that, we can understand not just how you can mix different capitals to get different services, but what's the influence on the long-term resilience of service provision across these areas. Okay, and then challenge two and three, who benefits and best practices for governance, which are really important, but I'm not going to um, I, I'm not going to stop uh, too long on those. Um, instead, I want to go on to uh, how we're taking all of this. So what we did in the Monteregie um, with our stakeholders, my sense of what are the most interesting questions for ecosystem services, and what are we doing with that next. So we are building a thing called ResNet, uh, which is the resilient, uh, resilient network for natural resource management across Canada, and we're trying to scale up this sort of management uh, to, to all of Canada. So um, our mission with this project is to transform Canada's capacity to monitor, forecast, and manage, in this case, in particular, production systems. So agriculture, forestry, mining, fisheries, and I'm missing one. Um, and the ecosystem services that are provided in those landscapes and the benefits that they provide for people. Um, and so we're asking questions like, well, what services do we need to measure across all of these different production systems if we want to improve management? And can we measure the, how can we measure the benefit flows of those services? I'm trying to understand what are the guidelines for choosing indicators? One of the biggest issues that came up when we worked in the Monteregie was the indicators for ecosystem services are all over the place because so many people are working with existing data. So we do this thing where we, you know, um, uh, we, we measure one thing and then we say, ah, oh, that, that's a good indicator of this other thing. 
And then a miracle occurs, and we only ever talk about the surface for the entire rest of the paper, and we never go back to what the indicator was or, or really investigate whether that's a good indicator at all. Um, and so we're really interested in how do you choose those indicators? How do you set norms? How much do you need to measure? Where do you need to measure? Um, and how can we measure most effectively for measuring across a, a vast country like Canada? Um, we're working with IBM to develop data platforms, smart sensors, other things that can be used to monitor things in, in situ, much like, uh, like NEON is doing across the United States or GeoBon across, uh, across the globe. Uh, and then we're trying to work to understand um, how do we link this uh, to existing monitoring of human well-being. So Canada has great stats on human health and other measures of human well-being across the country. Can we link what we're going to measure with, about ecosystem services to measures of human well-being and try to better understand the linkage between what services are being provided and how people are doing? And, and really importantly, what's the role of trade in all of that? So there's a lot of food being produced in the area around Montreal, but that's not affecting my well-being because I'm going to the grocery store and I'm buying my oranges from Florida. So how do I link my well-being to services that are being provided and incorporate that very complicated aspect of trade in all of this? Um, and then finally, how do we think about time lags? We know that time lags and legacies and these things are, are important but a lot of what we're measuring and model, monitoring right now is very um, static maps over time, uh, static maps and not over time. So we're hoping that this kind of monitoring over time can lead us to places where we can get at these issues of time lags and legacies um, and delays. Okay, so back to my globe. I spent a lot of time, I think, in a really deep dive um, of, of local science, but I do want to come back out to this idea of the Anthropocene because I, I think we are, we are living in a world that is changing really fast. It's changing as fast or maybe faster than we can monitor and measure and, and understand it. And somehow our job in this Anthropocene is to figure out how do we survive on this planet? How do we survive with this planet? How do we make sure that that the biodiversity that's on this planet survives with us. Um, and I think that these sorts of ideas, things like planetary boundaries and especially things like ecosystem services, they're scientific concepts that have the potential to bring us to a place where maybe we can do the kinds of science that's needed to solve these um, critical issues. And maybe we can do that through a kind of co-design with communities that helps us get at questions that are theoretically interesting to us as scientists and useful to communities on the ground. Thanks. Can I do questions? Can I do questions? I will, if people have questions. Those questions you want to hear. I'm very interested in the map you had between 1970 and 19, um, 2013. Mm -hmm. And you made the point that the ecosystem services were the same, but they were redistributed, they became more specialized, mm -hmm. in each one in certain areas in the 2001 compared. Now, what, what effect does that have? Simply the specialization in the ecoservices themselves, as opposed to the distributed picture, uh, which I take as 1971. Yeah, so, so the question is, what effect does that have? And the, I think the answer is, we don't really know. Presumably, it must be affecting who can access those services, right? So who's, who's accessing it if, what's that? Perhaps the role of the services. And, and maybe it affects the role of the services. Um, yeah, but, but for sure it's affecting, you know, recreation all gets into this one place. And so it affects the, the economics of those communities that are investing in, facilities for recreation. It affects those communities. Those communities, you know, this is my recreation. Those communities are now being influenced by Montreal and Quebec policies that are, that are, that are changing things. And, and maybe it changes, you know, when my communities come to me and say, can I, do I need riparian areas or can I just build that water treatment plant? The answer to that question is maybe different when you're in this world where everybody's specialized than it is in that world where 
where things are distributed. And we, we have no idea if it looks like this anywhere else. <laughs> Do you have any notion of which of these uh, ecosystem services are, um, have uh, essentially positive feedback uh, between one another? And is there, is there any way of disentangling the ones that um, are, are self-reinforcing versus the ones that are competitive in what their effect on the map is? Oh, in what their effect on the map is. I was thinking, OK, I got this one. Um, we know which ones have these positive correlations, and I think we have a pretty good sense of how to maintain those. For some of the ones that have trade-offs, like let's say agriculture and water quality, that's a particular trade-off that's been studied a lot. And so I feel like we, we at least know what we should do about that one. And Quebec has, I mean, since the 1980s, Quebec has had a policy that every farmer has to balance their phosphorus and nitrogen budgets farm by farm. It's not helping us deal with the legacy of 100 years of agriculture before that. But we have a sense that some of these we can pull apart. And, and that others we really can't. They're just driven together by, by land use legacies or other things, and there's no disentangling of them. How that influences the, that map over time is a more complicated question, and I don't know the answer to that. It's a good question, though. And I think we have, we have the data. We could look at at least pieces of that. You build a network of services and of influences. Because the point you made is it's important to distinguish between the, whether they're just co-responding to a driver or whether they're actually influencing each other. That's right. And so we have some, we have at least mental maps of in this region, which are responding to each other. But we've done that pair by pair. It gets really complicated when you start to do that for six services at a at a at a time. But we could do that, and then we could compare it against these against these maps. Yes. So I want to ask a remedial question first. And and can you walk me through yep. these maps that make it obvious that in fact the the system is getting more specialized in 2006 to 1971? So tell me. What I need to look at to say, yeah, that really is more specialized. That word specialized okay. has a lot of a, a lot of meaning. So, so what I will do because it, it's it's a little bit hard to see from these maps, but what I can do is show you the equations and the data that for sure show that. And by specialized, what I mean is the, the each one of these is a municipality, so each different. Uh, block there as a municipality, that the municipalities go from every municipality is producing a bundle of services over a certain threshold level. So you have every municipality is producing at least three services over a threshold to a situation where most municipalities are only producing one service over that, that threshold. And so that's what's happening when I say specializing. They're going from producing three or more services at a level that we say, OK, this is the level where it counts, to producing one service at that level where it counts. And so the, the follow-on question then, and it'll be the last one, is, uh, is, uh, is there any dominant axis of land use change that explains the lion's share of your specialization? So that the one that's most common in the eastern half of this country is agricultural abandonment mm -hmm. and succession. And so, and so in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a farmland that had a wood lot and a, you know, you know, a bunch of different right, places to live and so on, mm -hmm. you end up with a forest. And that would, in a sense, look more specialized. Yep. But it's a question of how you count the services that the forest provides. Yeah. Right? Because the forest, this, this each one of these specialized places, in a sense, supplies many services. So I just don't get how you do the calculus without some much larger scaffold. Yeah. Um, so let me go back to the question about land use first and, and to say what happens in this landscape between the 70s and 2006 is you have a very like market garden vegetable production oriented situation up here that moves towards a much more intensive corn soy with some stops in the middle for sugar beets. 
and then we get to corn, soy uh, down here. And that agricultural specialization then means that some of the counties can't keep up anymore. And so those counties say, hey, we can't keep up agriculturally, and they flip and turn to recreation primarily as their dominant, what's driving the economy in those, in those cities. And I think that that's probably what's happening. More than the forest area doesn't actually change all that much. So we don't have that same agricultural abandonment, but you get this real drive towards intensification. Is that black dot there? Is that Montreal? That's Montreal. Yeah, black dot's Montreal. That's, that's an interesting thing. That's dominating mm -hmm. these developments here. Uh, and it's just amusing, if I get to excuse the expression, to just see it as a, a, a black dot there. That's really dominating that dynamic. Yeah, and it still is, right? So it was, you know, it was, it's, it's this black dot that decided that this whole area is going to preserve 17% of their, their land in every one of these counties for, as green space. They didn't define what green space is, but, but it's, that, that came down from the black dot to everybody else. So there's a question over here. Yeah, I had a question that honestly, is the, the honest answer. And, and you know, this came up in, in conversations this morning was even, you know, how do you do this science? Because we didn't want to be driven by what the communities wanted. And in fact, a lot of their questions were like, oh yeah, we've known the science of that for 30 years. We don't want to answer that question. It took a long time to figure out what was the spot where the question was scientifically interesting and useful. And, and one of the questions I get asked all the time about that is like, well, okay, great, but for a PhD student who can't sit around and wait for two years to figure out what the right question is, what do you, how do you, how do you engineer that? I, I don't know how we're going to scale up. What we're doing right now is we, we've picked seven landscapes across Canada that go all the way from the east through the central Canada to the west, including the north, and we're going to try this, something similar in, in seven landscapes and hope that that at least gets us one step further down the road of saying, okay, well, this worked great for agricultural settings. We learned a lot about what to measure and what not to measure. If we can do that now in forest, we've got some forested areas, some mining areas, areas in the north where agriculture is expanding into those areas, it's going to have a massive impact on, on carbon storage in those areas, that, that hopefully that can get us one step further towards well, what would you want to measure across the country. And um, Statistics Canada, which runs all of our census and agricultural census, is super interested in, in trying to create some sort of accounting system. What, what, what should we measure? How should we measure it? Where do we need to measure it? And so we're working with them to kind of balance between those two. But um, I don't know, invite me back in five, six, seven years, and then I'll, maybe I'll be able to answer. Please come back in seven years. <laughs> <laughs> Done. So uh, Elena has a luncheon plan now, so please join me in thanking her for this. <laughs>